light. And for those of you that are live streaming, I'm Jerry Spizzaro. I'm part of the pastoral staff team uh, here at New Life. And uh, this morning we've got a special service where um, we're going to be sharing stories of gratitude for God's work in our lives um, really over the last year and a half. And um, we've mentioned Thanksgiving now a couple of times today. Um, but actually, I, I think it's one of the most difficult weeks in the whole year to be thankful. Here's why. One, it's a shorter week, and that means there's more to do and less time. Secondly, some of you are traveling. That's another distraction and takes a lot of time. Thirdly, some of us are hosting, planning meals, getting ready for company, cooking. All that means less time more distractions. And then finally, two words that some of us love and some of us hate, Black Friday, <laughs> which has actually already started online. So it is really easy to not be focused or intentional about showing gratitude. And we've actually, our country has actually set aside a day for us to, to be intentionally grateful. Now, hopefully every day we're supposed to be Grateful, but one day set aside for intentional gratitude, and yet it's very difficult. And um, so I want to share with you a passage of scripture. So go ahead and put that up for me. <clears throat> Luke 17. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, I want to bring out, um, oh, wait a minute, sorry. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And by the way, he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. I want you to look closely at, whoops, I want you to look closely at, I can't get that, at that passage. <clears throat> because in verse 14, Jesus tells them, go show yourself to the priests. He doesn't say or command them to come back and give him thanks. But in verse 17, Jesus says, we're not all 10 cleansed. Where are the other nine? In other words, although he didn't command it, it was a given. It was a given that they would return and be grateful. It was a given that they would not take for granted this good gift. Um, there's another, there's other two other words. Let's see if I don't know if they're, nope, okay. There's two other words I want to make a note of. In verse 14, you see that in the second sort of paragraph there? As they went, they were cleansed. That word cleansed, so the first nine were, they were actually they were all cleansed. But when the other lep, when the ninth or the tenth leper went back to Jesus, you can see at the very end of verse 17, the word there is, he was made well. All of them were cleansed. But he was made well. The difference in those two words is the word cleansed has to do with really being medically healed. But the word well refers to that he was not just medically well, he became whole. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And I think the, you know, the thing for us to note is that we can be thankful at any time, but when our gratitude is rooted in the source of life of God, there is a greater a wholeness available to us. And so I want to really encourage you this Thanksgiving to be intentional. Find time to reflect and thank God for your good gifts. Every good gift you have in your life, spiritually, emotionally, physically, relationally, every good gift comes from above. And so think through, how am I going to carve out space to really 
do what the day is all about. Whether you do it personally or whether you get a little creative, think about who else you're going to be with that day and maybe do something appropriate for the whole group. But I leave you with that, that, that exhortation. But today, we're going to have a chance. We're, we're all lepers, right? We're all lepers, and we're all coming back to Jesus to say thank you for how he's worked in his life. And I want to introduce you first to, to Peggy. Wave to say hello, Peggy. This is Peggy. <laughs> I call Peggy's story, um, it's a coming to faith story, and God works in mysterious ways. So Peggy was born in, um, I'll give you a little background to, to each story, and then I'll have them share. Uh, but Peggy was born in Taiwan, so there she is on her, she's the littler one, on her mom's lap there. She came to the United States at age 15, and really though, all her adult life, she has been a searcher of knowledge and truth, really wanting to know what life is about. And so she sought every philosophy and Buddhism and Tibetanism and Hinduism and New Age, and I'm sure there are, are others. And one thing she told me was, never in a million years did I think I would find it in Christianity. And so, but it's the breakup of a 17-year relationship, a few years back, that, that kind of breaks her and begins to, breaks her heart, begins to open up that heart uh, to God. But just, for, just tell us in a few words, you know, what it was like for you when that breakup happened. Well, I, I become numb. Um, I have no hope, no love, loveless, hopeless. Um, just basically walking through life, go with the motion, uh, dead woman walking, basically. So yeah. I don't feel, I'm afraid to feel. Well, yeah. And you, and you said that even though you had given all hope and you had actually, you sort of on dead on the inside, you didn't realize how dead you were. Yeah, I thought I was fine. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But um, her neighbor, Irene, there in the picture, Irene is also happens to be on a spiritual quest for truth. And Irene ends up at New Life. And then she invites her, her neighbor, um, Peggy, to New Life. So Peggy comes, and something happens in that service where something, you know, in the service, worship message resonates with her heart. She's not quite sure what, and it begins to open up a little bit more. But <clears throat> Irene is now, has come to faith. She's a growing Christian. She's, she's learning how to pray. She's learning how to share her faith. So she asks Peggy if she can practice on her, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> and, and, and she's, a, you know, a a begrudgingly but willing, you know, friend. So Irene is praying for her, or actually you know, praying, practice praying, and sometimes praying with you and for you. And sometimes you would end up in tears, really not even knowing what the tears were about. But the, the funny thing for me is she invites her to go do evangelism with her. See, she's learning how to share her faith, Irene, but she's afraid to go by herself. So she asks her to go with her. <laughs> so now she's Sharing, she doesn't even believe in Jesus, and she's sharing faith. Okay, <laughs> so, um, but share this now. Evangelism for you is a new experience this time. You've had people try and evangelize you, or, and what, what's different this time? They're annoying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, go away. Don't want to hear. Don't want to know. Yeah, you're right. So you used to experience people who would come up to share their faith with you as annoying. Like, leave me alone. But now you're on the other side. You're the one sharing. And she finds out, oh, there are really people interested. Not everybody's like, go away. So she starts doing that. And then she becomes a part of the paraclete ministry, which is a ministry where people pray for you. So I in red and others, she starts attending the paraclete ministry. Again, God is working mysterious ways. This woman's not a Christian yet. So she goes to the paraclete ministry, and they start praying for her, and then share what happens as you walk home one night from the paraclete prayer ministry. Um, I was so touched by God because... Talk a little louder. Like, he's so loving, and I don't know if he could accept me, but I want to know him. So on my way home, I keep saying, I want to know you. I want to know you, but how? How do I know you? And 
in an audible voice, he said, then you know my son. It was that clear. And I'm um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. And why was Christianity different for you versus the other pursuits of knowledge and truth that you had pursued? Um, because this guy is real. All the other is you, you read about it, you're trying to do everything uh, to be good so you can get there. This one meet you at where you are, where you're so broken, so feel like you're nothing, and he takes you in, and it, it's a beautiful thing. So, so... <laughs> Okay, so Peggy starts growing, and she says her mind is catching up with her heart. But she starts pursuing Christianity like she did, you know, she's still in that old mode of trying to pursue now, I'm going to know this thing, I'm going to conquer this thing, I'm going to figure this out. So you start reading your Bible. Well, trying to, um, but couldn't read it. It was, it was like doing homework. And I get so frustrated. I feel like I'm just trying to get it over with. And finally, I get so frustrated, I, I cry out and scream up to God. It's like, I love to read. You know I love to read, Lord, like I'm telling him. Um, but how come I can't read your, read your word? And I know your word is the living word, and, and I want to know. So if you don't help me, I quit using your <laughs> I quit. So I stop trying to read and just let God lead me, and he helped me. He helped me to read the Bible in two months. <laughs> right, so she read through the whole it's Bible amazing. in two months. Yeah. Right, so then, and you pursued getting um, help here at church, you're attending EHS, you're attending Bible study, and you realize, wow, I want to be baptized. Just share what baptism meant for you. Um, it was like, like I, I finally commit myself, and um, the, I remember the night before going to bed, I didn't think it was anything. I was just thinking about, oh, I'm going to get baptized, and suddenly I feel this wedding jitter. I weep. <laughs> I weep, and like my heart just feels so glad, so joyful that I'm joining him. Yeah, so yeah. it was like for you, is the experience of really being married to Jesus, yes. your lover. My lover. Right? Yes. Your, your new lover. My new lover. Hey, <laughs> the best lover. <laughs> Amen to that. You're, you're, you're involved with the second and third graders downstairs and, and the Elmhurst community. How are you different now in terms of being able to, you know, relate to others Etc. Um, I I grew up very shy. My mother will tell you I hide behind her leg. But um, even in in my goodness, trying to help people in my heart before I couldn't, because I would start thinking, oh, they don't, they may not want me to help. And but now God changed my heart, and I just go. I just go help. Mm. You know, and it's wonderful. Right. So you said we used to be very hesitant. Yeah. Now yeah. you are just eager and helping all over the place. Right, because his love just... Right. <laughs> Next class you have to go to is limits. <laughs> right, thank you, Peggy. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I have one more thing I wanted to mention with you. You, you know, she was afraid to pray in the beginning, as all of us are. Like, we don't know what to say. So what silence, what did that mean for you? It was, it was such a revelation because um, people also tell me, read the Bible, pray. I don't know how to pray. I didn't grow up knowing, hearing people pray. So when um, EHS the, the tell you to sit in silence, when people say, sit in silence, I'm like, oh, I can do that. I can totally do that. <laughs> I said, that's great. Yeah. And you mentioned how you really loved meeting God in silence. Yes. You know, so yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next, we have Hector and Adelaide, and their story, now these guys were high school, they've been together 47 years. This is the junior, I mean, they 
are one handsome couple. And, and, and uh, this is his junior prom, and I really want you to notice the shoes. I love the shoes. <laughs> okay. And there's their wedding day a few years later. So this is a story of high, high school sweethearts who God leads to even to deeper intimacy in their marriage after 47 years. Okay? So, Adelaide, let's begin with you and just share a little bit of uh, what it was like to, to grow up in the home that you grew up, how that impacted you. Uh, one of the things that impacted me uh, in a deep way was that I grew up in an environment where I was not allowed to share my emotions. So sadness, anger, frustration, uh, I, I couldn't voice that, I couldn't get it out. And all those things just kind of got stifled up inside of me. Mm-hmm. And because it was such a big part of me, it drew me more into myself, and it impacted a lot of my relationships over the years. Right. So, so because now, coming into adulthood, you got to go to work, you, gotta go, you go to church, you have a family. How does that yeah. affect though, all those relationships in those places? You know, Jerry, it's kind of strange because... because I was married, and I had a family, and I had children, and I was working, that part of me was just such a part of me and it was so ingrained. It was almost, I, my life was on automatic. I didn't allow myself the freedom to express those things. I just kind of right, so stifled what, what them happened, in. What happens if you get hurt at work or you get hurt at church or you get hurt? I don't have a voice. I don't know how to speak up for myself. Mm-hmm. I develop a victim mentality, like, well, these things will just happen, and I can't do or say anything. Wow, that's painful. That's painful. Extremely painful. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it was such a big part of me. So of the rest of my life was unautomatic. Wow. I just did what I had to do, and just was just there. Wow. Festering and just affecting me in a very bad way. Yeah, festering is a good word. And Hector, share about the home you grew up in, how that impacted, impacted you coming into adulthood, especially in how you related to Adelaide and your family. Um, well, <clears throat> I was born in Puerto Rico, came here when I was seven and a half months old and was raised up in the South Bronx. And uh, my dad had a second grade education and uh, his methodology of raising us was, his word was the last word and there was no other no other change, no other opinion that held sway. It was what my dad said. Um, he was very stern about that. And uh, growing up, I didn't have a voice. If I tried to express my own opinion, I was shut down real quick. Um, and then growing up in the South Bronx, where everybody wants to be a tough guy, you know, I became very, very hardened walking the streets and, and challenging people because uh, nobody was gonna shut me up. I had had enough of dad shutting me up at the house. But it's like Pete says, you know, um, Jesus may be in your heart, but grandpa's in your bones. So as much as I didn't want to be like my father, um, I became just like him. And, and that's exactly what I used to do. I used to, um, Adelaide, it was always, almost like we were made for each other. Like she knew her place. She, she knew her place. She knew how to be quiet <laughs> and not speak up or anything. And, uh, and I also would let her know what she, what she wanted to think and what she wanted to say. If she wanted to say something, I would let her know what she wanted to say and what she wanted to think, because that's the way I was raised up. Um, And so that that translated into uh, things like like trying to guess what you were gonna say, what what anybody was gonna say. So if you were speaking to me, I would finish a sentence for you. Before you had finished your sentence, I would finish it for you because I already knew what was coming. I prided myself on my intellect and being real quick, sharp of wit and uh, I would always be finishing her sentences for her. And talk about that watershed moment. And we had a watershed moment where um, I was very involved in, in church. And I forget exactly the circumstance, but it was in front, I know that it was in front of a number of people. And Adelaide would always, at home, when she was talking, I would always be finishing her sentences for her. And she would tell me, no, that's not what I was going to say. That's not what I was going to say. And then she would finish her sentence. But I was always cutting her off because that's what I had learned to do. And one day publicly in front of some people um, that we were talking with, 
she went to say something to make a statement, and I finished it for her, and she said in front of them, that's not what I was going to say. And then she finished saying what she was saying, and I could feel the blood rushing up to my head. I could feel myself getting red with embarrassment. I was so upset that she did this in front of... <laughs> <clears throat> in front of all these people. Um, but it was a watershed moment for me because I also pride myself on being a learner. So I took that home with me. And I said, why do you always, I kept asking myself, why do you always have to finish your sentences? She's been doing this at home. You asked for this. It happened publicly because she's been doing it privately. You're always cutting her off and always finishing off what she has to say. And so it was a watershed moment for me to try to slow down, bite my tongue, and say, wait a minute, she's got something to say. Let me shut up and let me listen to what she's got to say first before I respond. Yeah. And how did you feel? Oh, me? Yes, Adelaide. <laughs> Three cheers for Adelaide. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. And, and, but what I really I do appreciate about Hector, even though you had blind spots, but you were, you, are, you were always sought to have a teachable spirit, you know? So just um, to bring this, your piece sort of to some to closure, really important here is how are, you, see, how are you entering each other? How are you experiencing each other now in terms of incarnationally? You know, Job says uh, for a lot of his life, he, he heard the Lord, but now he sees him, like he was experiencing, he, after a series of, you know, terrible events in his life, he, he, ha, he was now experiencing God on a whole different level. And so how are you really literally, you know, seeing each other's interior and not just the outside? Do you want to go first? Okay. <laughs> I promise not to cut you off. Okay. Um... What, what, what's happening is this, and again, it's God's perfect timing. I think on the negative side, when we first met and we were dating and we got married, it was all the elements of the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. Me not having my voice, right. me not being in tune with my emotions, and Hector just kind of being Hector. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and trampling that and not allowing that right. voice to come forth. Right. And because of the way I was thinking and processing this whole thing, I just kind of gave in to that. Yeah, but now what is it like to but have your now, voice? But now, praise the Lord, I, I know for me personally, speaking in the eye, I was very blessed to be part of a cell group Oops. where... <clears throat> with with the Lord's prompting and with what I experienced, I found my voice. Mm -hmm. And in finding that voice, now I have that freedom where I can express myself mm -hmm. and acknowledge all of my emotions, the good and the bad, because that's a part of me. That's how God made us. Mm -hmm. right. And what that has done is that now I can speak to Hector, and I, I'll let him speak for his piece, but... I have the freedom that I can speak, and I know that he's listening. Yeah, that's a big and part. That, it's a big part, yeah. And it's just, just, it's done wonders, wonders for our relationship because, again, we've known each other for long. We did the dating thing. We did the newlywed thing. We've been married. We just celebrated 38 years married. But now we're retired. Yeah. And we're in our golden years. Mm -hmm. And God has given us this wonderful <laughs> gift of communication and being able to, to share our minds and respect each other. And I can't think of a better way to kind of go in on this new journey. Amen, amen. And Hector. Emotionally. <laughs> emotionally healthy spirituality and, and being part of the, so, the, the small groups as well uh, has helped me and um, <clears throat> uh, our intimacy um, has grown. And by intimacy, I mean that um, I, I was, I love my mother when she was alive. I mean, she always hugged me. She always held me close. And uh, that was a big contrast to the way that my dad was. And, uh, and I missed that. And because of the way Adelaide grew up, she didn't get much affection. And, and so it was difficult for her to give. And that's one of the things that has changed in our relationship now. Um, 
Adelaide, Adelaide constantly comes over at the most unexpected times and she'll come over and she'll grab me or she'll hold me close or she'll hold my hand or she'll hug me and press me real hard. And I got to tell you that that does wonders for me with regard to intimacy. It's not all in the bedroom. You know, there's just an intimacy and a deep love that we share. And I'm just so happy for that. How's your listening? My, my listening as a result of EHS has become incarnational. Um, <clears throat> instead, of, instead of trying to figure out what Adelaide is going to say or how I'm going to fix her when she starts to describe a problem or an issue, I've, I've learned to separate myself and really understand what it means to treat her as a thou. To say she's not an it, she's got a voice and there's something that's working inside of her and it may not be what's working inside of me, it's, it's working inside of her and I need to listen to what she's going through. I may have answers. Maybe the experience she's sharing with me is something that I know how to handle, that I, I know how to do it, but I know how to do it the way I know how to do it, not the way that she knows how to do it. And that has taught me to listen, be careful to listen to what she's saying. And he's doing it very well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Josh. Hey. This is Josh. And so, Josh, your story I like to call the double life. Well, I don't like to call it, but it was the double life. Um, but, you know, God set, this is the, a double life that, where God sets you free, really free from the double life syndrome to an abundant life. Um, so you grew up in a Christian family and went to church most of your life, Christian high school, but then you would come back to a neighborhood filled with gang violence. And... In that context, it was either do or die. Like, I got to join them or I'm going to get killed. And that, so you join them. But that would begin uh, a really a journey of a compartmentalized life where I'm a Christian on Sundays, so to speak, or in certain contexts, but the rest of the week, um, I'm a different person. And uh, a lot of anger, a lot of anger because of this double life experience um, in high school, your life was filled with drinking, violence, and sex. You know, you're a nice guy, again, on Sundays, but to be feared during the week. And what's interesting, though, is you have this dark side, but at the same time, you always had this spiritual hunger. Like, share your confirmation. I mean, you were going to church as a youth, and you really had an authentic confirmation experience. Yeah, in my church, they made you, um, to, to, to make and uh, pass confirmation, you had to get up in front of the church and have a statement of faith and give like a speech, you know? Um, and, um, and I just remember just being touched so powerfully, like at a young age, just that I knew God was calling me for something. I knew, and I was connecting with him on such a real level. And so you actually become a youth pastor. <clears throat> he becomes a youth pastor, and he takes this, this uh, little group of like, 12 kids, grows it to like 200, but um, you were, you know, doing uh, destructive activities really during the week, um, and, but getting to church on Sunday mornings, you know, and um, then it's off to local college, uh, but then there was a series of disappointments in your life, even though like this, you know, God's using your gifts but your character wasn't, uh, you know, weren't integrated. And so then there's all these disappointments, the disappointment of uh, college, university, seminary. You actually started two seminaries, ended up um, not, not being able to finish those for various reasons. Uh, a seven-year relationship with a girlfriend ends, and um, this just increases, right, the anger. You find yourself back in Queens in a dead end job, literally digging ditches for, for and um, but then there's a there's a turn of events. Something happens at home where firm family circumstances enable you to take over a family business. So that gets you out of the ditches. Uh, you also meet your future wife, and you get married. And what looks like a good thing actually ends up sort of being a calm before the big storm. Things really come apart at 35. Uh, you are still drinking all night before you come to church in the morning. You get arrested for an alcoholic incident. 
if there's a lot of conflict between you and your wife, you still have so much anger, and then rock bottom happens when your wife comes and asks you for a divorce. So just kind of share a little bit, what was that moment like for you? Yeah, so basically, I really loved the Lord and had a fervor for him and wanted to serve him, but I had all these areas in my life that I didn't let him into, like my sexuality and my pain, and I didn't know how to deal with these things. And so, um, you know, I, I drank a lot and I became angry and, and um, it was, I, I just had too many areas of my life that I didn't let him into. And um, he just developed a stronghold and I was living a double life. I really did love the Lord. My ministry was fruitful, but he had these trenches, these areas in my life where I couldn't move forward. I couldn't get out of it. I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't, you know, um, you know, if anybody pushed me or hurt me, I... I reacted with wrath, you know, and, um, yeah. And so, you know, you had mentioned to me that you had felt like a failure and loser. You know, I've got college loans, seminary hasn't worked out. He says, I even sought out a third generation Christian girl and that didn't work out. And then the failed marriage. And then the failed marriage. So you're really at the bottom and then something happens at the gym of all places. A lot happens, I think, with God at the gym and in the bathroom. I don't know. We're, we're still, we're still long enough to hear him. So tell us what happens at the gym on the treadmill. So I have two sisters, um, and I'm the only boy, and um, they're both very strong women. They're both pastor's wives. So my older sister was like, you better not date anyone for at least six months. You, you, you just got divorced. You know, you're going through a divorce. And I was like, six months? <laughs> what am I going to do with this time, you know? Because I was thinking, just jump back into another relationship. And so she said, I will chase you down, you know, and I said, okay, all right. And then my other sister, we were, you know, I would, I would spend some time with her and she said, come with me to the gym tonight. So I came with her to the gym and I didn't realize that night she was going to have the conversations of all conversations with me and that God was going to just come upon her like it was Moses coming down from the, (laughs) from the mountain with the 10 commandments. And uh, there we were in the gym, and everybody's looking, too, because she's, she's, she's pretty bold with her faith. And she was like, that's it, Josh. No more compromises. No more double standard. No more living one way and then and, and living compartmentalized. You have to give God access to everything. You, this has to be all in, all in now. No compromise. She just kept saying it. And I was just sitting there like shocked. Everybody at the gym is looking at us. And, um, and stuff like that. And she's throwing Bible verses at me. And that night it was Cinco de Mayo, ironically. <laughs> and, uh, and I went home and I, and I, and I was in my bed and, and, and I just, God spoke to me very quietly and he said, your life will never be the same after today. I'm going to come and take over. And, and, and he did. From that night forward, the, all, all of that stuff, just he came in and he just, he dealt with my sexuality. He dealt with the anger. He dealt with the, the substance abuse and the drug use. He dealt with, with, with all that in one shot, like, like, like that. And you said, quote, I don't care how much this is going to hurt. I'm not going to be obsessed with what my ex is doing or not doing. I can only focus on myself. No more beating people up and then worshiping God on Sundays. So, what happens next? So basically, at that particular point, you know, um, you know, I, 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 I basically, I, I'm in kind of in my own business, and that was part of the part of the reason me and my father are and were. And um, basically, I, I took over, so I had more freedom in, in my life at this point. And I said, if the business could make me unhealthy, then it could also make me healthy. So I started withdrawing four to five hours out of my day. I would go into the woods. There's, these, there's, there's a park by my house that's pretty big and deep, and you could go far into the woods. And so I went into the woods, and I just was like, I'm going to get right with God. And so I'd take four or five hours a day. This is for like three months. Then I would just cry out to him. I would read the Psalms. I would read the scriptures. I would, I would worship him like a madman out, and then I'd run into people every once in a while, and they'd be like, hi, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not talking to myself, I'm talking to God, and they'd be like, yeah, you know, and so, but I just got right with him, and I just cried out, and I said, God, I don't care how much it hurts, this living like this is too painful to live like this, I can't live like this anymore, I know it's going to be painful to move forward, but 
I, it, it's, it's time to go all the way. And I just, I just, just, just really cried out to God for three months straight. And you also then began to grow through a series of op- learning opportunities, um, divorce care at another church, EHS classes here, classes with Joe. You know, Joe Terry began sort of mentoring you. And um, I, what I, I really appreciate, though, what a friend said. You know, so you're beginning to change. But it, it, it kind of hits you when you're with a friend, and I think he was putting his son to bed or something. I don't know. You're with a friend. Tell a little about that little experience with a friend. Do you know which one I'm referring no. to? The one who said, you're, you're a good listener? Oh, yeah. So my friend, my friend was like, uh, you know, we, we, we were, he was kind of going through something, and, um, you know, and he just, we, we just kind of had this moment where he said, you know, I, he said to me, I don't know why I like, like, I like being, you know, um, friends with you all these years, but you're a really good listener. Like you just, you listen, you listen to what I have to say empathetically and selfishly. And, and I just, I was like, wow, you know, like I could see that, you know, I was, I, I'm able to enter into other people's worlds now that you I could see into that my you're, own. You're, you're thing. actually seeing that you're beginning to change. Absolutely. Significantly. Absolutely. And so, you, you know, you, at one point there was, uh, you ha- thought you had figured out what, once you got well, what it was going to look like. Your life, maybe, you know, you'd be reconciled to your ex and, and you'd have this job, you'd be making this much money, you'd be living here. You kind of had it figured out in your head. But how has it unfolded? Right. It, it, it didn't unfold the way that I thought it was going to be. A matter of fact, it, you know, I just felt like God telling me, you know, sometimes it really does have to get worse before it gets better. And I'm doing a deep work in you. This is not quick fix. This is a deep work. And um, so things didn't work out the way that I wanted to with, uh, you know, um, with, with the divorce or with, uh, you know, with my business. Um, we transitioned and had to kind of do you know, in going another direction on the fly. And, you know, I wasn't able to just like go back into seminary right away and, and, uh, right. or any of those things. It didn't work out that way, the way that I thought it was. It's a slow road back. I know that Pastor Pete always talks about the slow work of the Lord and it's been a slow process, but it's, it's been rewarding. So, yeah. So share about how you're feeling about your singleness now yeah. and yourself. Yeah, so, you know, I just, you know, I just, I, you know, you, you see in our culture, people just go from one relationship to another, and, you know, I was part of this uh, group called Divorce Care, and they encourage you, like, if you got a divorce, hey, like, you're statistically, you're, you're, you're probably going to end up in another one, and, and, you know, most likely, unless something dramatically changes. This can't be just little changes. Something really has to dramatically change, and, and so they said, you know, stay single and get and get your life right, you know, get, figure out what, what had happened. And, um, and I did that and I just, I opened myself up to God and in new ways, you know, and, um, and I just said, God, you know, and now I'm to the point where I, you know, I don't need a relationship or I'm not even looking for one, you know, and, um, you know, if, if that particularly comes, um, that'd be great. But, um, I, I, you know, I don't need that anymore. And I want to quote you, I'm on the other side. I like who I am. I'm rooted in a church. I get to take classes and I'm growing. I lost 30 pounds. I'm off anxiety medicine. I read. I take care of myself. I'm working up to a third office. I'm rebuilding my savings account. I have peace, joy, and hope. So we say thank you so much to all four of you for sharing your pearls with us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, One more time for Peggy, for Hector, for Adelaide, for Josh. Just an amazing story of God's activity. And every, every the, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, we pause to celebrate the transformation that's happening in our church, that God is at work, that God is alive, that God is moving. And one of the ways that we respond to the movement of God's work in our lives is by singing. So I want to invite you to stand. And we're going to close our time with just in song. One of the great ways in the scriptures, whenever God intervenes, we see songs come alive. We see hearts open up. And what we've seen today 
are stories of people who experienced the grace of Jesus and that grace is available for everyone in this room. And so as an act of gratitude for what the Holy Spirit is doing in our church, let's sing together. Amen. His love never fails. Amen. His love never fails. You know, Christianity is not about our relentless pursuit of God. It's about God's relentless pursuit of us. That God is consistently pursuing us with love and grace and compassion and forgiveness. He is pursuing us and he's pursuing all of us in this room right now. And so our response is ultimately to turn around to face this goodness. It's called repentance. And gratitude is very similar to repentance. We're focusing on gratitude this year. I want to invite the prayer team to come to my left here. Gratitude and repentance go hand in hand because this is what gratitude is. Gratitude is a knowing awareness that you are the recipient of goodness. That's what gratitude is. It's a knowing awareness you are, that you are the recipient of goodness, which makes you turn around to see the source of the goodness. And so repentance, it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And it is a knowing awareness that we have been the recipients of goodness that we turn around to go, that's where it's from. And so today's a moment for us to practice gratitude and to practice repentance. We've heard uh, four stories of how Jesus Christ is active and moving and transforming Peggy's life. Someone who was searching, her heart was searching all over the place and found it in the Son of God. We find Hector and Adelaide 47 years together, 38 years married. You would think, oh, whatever God was going to do, he probably did a long time ago. And yet, God is still at work, moving them deeper and deeper and deeper. Someone like Josh, who has hit rock bottom, who can't even, is there any way up? And yet is experiencing joy and life and a sense of a second chance. And some of you, all of us in this room, we are on that spectrum. Some of you, uh, you're looking for God. You've never said yes to Jesus, maybe even coming to church, but the Holy Spirit is calling you by name today. He, he is calling you by name. You've been searching and searching and searching, and the answer is found in the Son of God and Jesus Christ. He is the one who will satisfy your deepest longings. He is the one who will forgive you of your sin. He is the one who will offer you a new life. And at the end of the service here, we have a prayer team here. If you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never crossed a line to say, I want to follow you, I want to be yours, our prayer team will be here for you. For those of you in this room, maybe you've been following Christ for a long time, decades as it were, and you sense you need God to do something fresh in you. Whether it's in your single life, in your married life, whatever it is, you need God to do something fresh in you. Our prayer team is here to pray for a freshness of the Holy Spirit to come into your life. And maybe you've hit rock bottom. Maybe you are caught up in some addiction. Maybe you are caught up uh, in a lifestyle that's going nowhere. Maybe you feel like you've hit rock bottom and there's no way up. We gather as the people of God to say, no, with Christ, there's always a way up. If we would just surrender ourselves to him, there's always a way up. And so our prayer team is here. Our, the Lord's table is here. So we come, we take bread, we dip it in the cup, knowing that Jesus Christ went to the lowest of lows and resurrected in power. And so you can hit the lowest low, but when you attach yourself to Jesus, you become raised with him. You rise with him. And God's hand is not too short for anyone. He can stretch out his hand and reach you wherever you are. And so the Lord's table's to my right. Uh, a prayer team's to my left. Uh, Josh and Adelaide and Hector and Peggy, they're going to be downstairs in the lobby. And so I know many of you are going to want to high-five them and hug them and just thank them for pouring out their hearts to us today. And so uh, why don't you do that in the lobby downstairs? Let me pray a prayer, a blessing over you, those watching online. I want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. And may we walk in this uh, week of thanksgiving aware of the goodness of God towards us. And may we in turn be sources of blessing 
to those we encounter this week. And so with your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that you have been the recipient of goodness. And may this week, may you turn around consistently to face the source of that goodness in God. And may you in turn be the source of goodness to others. May your life be a blessing to those you meet. May you give out of the love you've received from Jesus. And so I bless you all today in the strong, in the beautiful, in the resurrected name of Jesus. And the people of God said,